Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Luke chapter 21, Christ telling us how to survive the end time, what he expects us to do in the end time. And as, as we covered in the 13th verse, it shall turn to you for a testimony. God's elect will be delivered up before the false Messiah and the Holy Spirit will speak through them. And this brings to pass the day of vengeance. It brings to pass the final um, time of the Gentiles, which we had completed in the last uh, chapter uh, of teach lecture. And that being that time that um, our Father takes back over. And that's going to happen. And God's elect have a strong part in it. That, um, and he, he guarantees you that um, in verse 18, that not one hair of your, on your head will, be, will perish. He takes care of it. That's what he orders Satan when Satan is cast out. Don't you dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. Well, he can't because that means God's truth. You know who he is, Satan. You're not about to worship him. So having said that, let's pick it up if we may in uh, Luke 21, verse 25, as we continue the instructions concerning the end times, how it's going to be. And what he actually covers here is the seven trumps, the seven seals, and the seven vials, the one in order as they come down the uh, chute here in this 21st chapter, as well as the 24th chapter of Matthew, 13th chapter of Mark, verse 25, word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea, and the waves roaring. And there will be signs. The fallen angels are going to be cast out of heaven again, along with the false one. And certainly... Um, Supernatural entities will perform miracles in the sight of man. Man's not geared for that, but you are. You know who they are, and you know the sequence which uh, brings to pass the chronological order of the event, the closing events of this earth age up to the millennium. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Well, what are the powers of heaven? Well, it's supernatural entities and principalities and high places. That means Satan and his fallen angels. You're told of this way back in the great book of Daniel, in the ninth chapter in the 27th verse. This is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Though the interpretation into the English from the, from the Hebrew, and it is Hebrew at this place, is not that well. I will do my best to straighten it out for you. Verse 27, it reads, concerning the false Christ. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That, that's that seventh missing days of Daniel's 70 weeks. It's the missing one. It's what we call the gap theory. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Why? They, the majority of people will cease taking the daily oblation, which is the cup of the Lord, for the true Christ and begin taking it with the fake. And for the overspreading of abominations, and because of that overspreading his wings, spiritually speaking, brings to pass abominations, that's people worshiping Satan instead of Christ, he shall make it desolate. He shall be the desolator, an entity, not a condition. 
even unto the consummation, that's the very end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate, it should be poured upon the desolator. He's going to get everything he's got coming to him. So there, there's going to be signs from the heavens and on the earth that only God's elect, who having studied God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, who are familiar with the events that consummate that age, will be familiar with. That's why you want to be sharp, because, again, remember the 13th verse of this chapter, it shall turn to you for a testimony. Father wants to use you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Okay, returning to chapter 21 of Luke, let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 27. And then, and not until then, you might say even after that, after the Antichrist appears, after the fall, fallen angels appear, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You know, this is going to be a shock to a lot of Christians, would-be Christians. They're going to think that they have been worshiping Christ, and lo and behold, they find out the true Christ is coming, and they've been worshiping Satan. Not a good place to be, my friend. Not a good place at all, but that's what will, what will get you there. Not studying the letter that God has sent to you, whereby he expects from you a testimony. He expects from you to be able to, to maneuver in these scriptures and to know the events and the chronological order of those events, whereby you know what's happening. It will not be until after that. Now, what does that mean then? Get it straight in your mind and let it settle in real deep. There are not, there's not only one tribulation, there are two. Two tribulations. The first one is the tribulation of the Antichrist. Now, after that, then comes the tribulation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about either of them, really. A hair of your head cannot be, will not perish. But Christ is coming, and it's going to be bad for those that are non-believers. But he's not angry at you, because you believe. And you can be right in the middle of the whole thing, and you will not be harmed. Why? God's not angry at you. He loves you. Verse 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, I said begins to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Your Redeemer draweth nigh. Praise God, he will be here. And there will be, uh, that is the day that we look forward to. This is the time that Christ has been preparing them for, the second advent. It's coming. How are you fixed um, with knowledge and understanding and discernment to go through this situation, two tribulations? Piece of cake for those that are informed. For that hour of temptation is easy for us because we do not find Satan tempting. But if you have been taught that you're going to fly away, that's Satan's message when he comes first. I've come to fly you away. They're going to jump in bed with him. That's a sad, sad state of affairs. Expecting to be a virgin bride remain for Christ. And there you've hooked up with Satan's church, thinking it was Christ. Why? Because you hadn't read God's Word. It's so simple a child can understand if you let the Word flow chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Verse 29, And he spake to them a parable, <clears throat> and he this is something in Mark, he said, don't, maybe you should learn this. Learn it, he said, and you're supposed to learn it. He spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees. Verse 30, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh, is now nigh at hand. In other words, when the leaves begin to shoot forth, let's take a little horticulture here and study a moment. How do you plant a fig tree? Well, you don't plant it with seed. You set out a shoot. So naturally, it's already a shoot, so it doesn't take it long till it begins shooting forth leaves. 
Well, what was this? Uh, why is this parable important? Well, listen and learn. 31. <clears throat> so likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. 32. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now, did he say maybe? No, he said absolutely. In that generation of the fig tree, all prophecies concerning this earth age up to the millennium will be fulfilled. All of it. And he has foretold us all things. Have you been listening? Have you been listening to his word? Well, how do I learn the parable of the fig tree? Well, first go back. Where do fig leaves first come into play in God's word? Well, in, in the book of Genesis. Genesis, uh, where Adam and Eve were seduced by Satan, and who, where do they cover themselves with? Where did it happen? Well, it happened in the fig grove, because they, so, they, they made together fig leaves to cover their, not their mouths, they didn't eat anything, to cover their private parts, for they had been seduced by none other than the serpent, the devil, that old dragon, Lucifer, whatever name you want to call him by, the devil himself. <clears throat> With Christ telling them, leave him alone. You can partake of the natural fruit trees, but don't touch the tree that has the bad knowledge, both the good and the evil knowledge. That tree is none other than Satan, whereas the tree of life is Christ himself. But that's where it started at. In a fig grove, right in chapter 3, the great book of Genesis. And then many times later, Christ would draw attention to it when one, one place he would curse the fig tree. Only you've got to know which fig tree it was he cursed. And you better know what the sh sh fig tree Smyrna means uh, to know the church of Smyrna, which is one of the only two churches Christ was pleased with. But the prime makeup of the parable of the fig tree you find in Jeremiah chapter 24 where you got two baskets of figs here one you can't touch them they're so bad not fit to eat and then you have a basket of fruit that is wonderful it's delicious and this is why God wanted you to know the difference between the Kenites and God's children and then he goes on to tell you when Judah returns to Jerusalem, when Judah returns to Israel and forms the nation Israel, that's the generation. Well, how, how many times has that happened? Well, let's see. When Christ walked the earth, how many times was the nation Israel founded from that time to this? Only once. Well, you know, let's see. Uh, you don't even need to know two and two make four. Because it only happened one time. It happened in the year of our Lord, May the 15th, 1948. That's when it happened. And that established the generation of the fig tree. And until that, before that generation passes away, all prophecy will be fulfilled. That generation is beginning to get some age on it. And that's why you see prophecies popping around the world bringing to fulfillment these events that Christ has warned you would come to pass. Be alert. You're living in that time. <clears throat> so, it is good of our Father to let us know these things, to absorb them. For man only fears the unknown. And when you know what's about to go down, you brace yourself, pray for courage, and you you cut it. You are a can-do type person. That's why God knows, as the verse 13 says, he can turn to you for a testimony. He can turn to you to fight the enemy, to come against the enemy, which is to say Satan's false teaching, his lies, and all those things he does to try to turn away the truth from our people. Verse 33, to continue. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, what does that mean? You see, you should know 
this, this earth is not going to pass away and heaven's not going to pass away. So let's interpret it properly. This earth age and this heaven age will pass away, but this heaven and this earth will still remain. Out of all times, we only have one earth and we only have one heaven. They are, there are different ages of heaven. There's three to be exact, and they're all recorded in the second chapter of Peter, the great book of Peter in the third chapter. And there are only three, there's only one earth, but three earth ages. And the events that transpire within that, uh, in that heavenly and earthly age. So these ages are going to change. But God's word will never change. That's why if there's any one thing you can spend your time on and know you're not going to be robbed, if there's any one thing you spend your time on and know it's never going to change, it's the word of God. And many will try to twist you this way and that way. You stick to the manuscripts and do not let man bend you one way or the other. Bring God's word forth as he has written it. Thank God for the Maserat that locks the text. And there we go. Verse 34. And take heed to yourselves. You be real careful. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life and so that day come upon you unawares. In other words, your brain gets numb from the ways of the world and alcohol. And do you, do you know what? Uh, learn a Greek word. Surfeiting is really a French word based in part, but be that as it may. It means a hangover. It means pain suffered from over drinking to where you can't even think straight for yourself. Don't let that happen to you. Stay sharp. Stay alert. A watchman on duty can only be a watchman if he or she is sharp, alert, and ready for that that comes. God knows who he can depend on. God knows who he can trust. And God knows who is loyal. And that's why he uses whom he does. Because you can never con him. So, again, surfeiting, suffering from a hangover. Hangover in more ways than one, both from alcohol and the tricks and deception of Satan in this world. Don't get all overworked, overcharged, over, uh, 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 underexposed to truth and get carried away in things of the world, or you'll suffer for it. It's that easy. Verse 35, For as a snare, that's a trap, shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. That's, that's the way it happens, and, and so it is, unexpectedly. Do you know why it's mostly unexpected? And it's, it's so plain that a child can see it. The reason most will be, it will be unexpected, the return of the true Christ, because they're going to think he's already here in the Antichrist. They're going to think everything is ducky. I mean, here's, here's the Lord before them, only it's the wrong Lord. Here they got Christ right before them, and they're eating right out of his hand. And they think it's just ducky. They got it made. He loves them, and they love him. There's just one problem. It's Satan. And loving Satan and taking from Satan has a price to it. You'll have a hangover, all right. It'll be a spiritual hangover and great pain from deception and from not having used common sense to be a watchman where the 13th verse of this chapter where God could turn to you for a testimony passed you by in the night because you thought Christ was already here and all it was was the Antichrist. 
You know, you want well, how could I possibly be deceived? Because of teachings. You don't have to understand God's word. You're going to be gone. You're going to fly away. You're, why, why would you want to learn the book of Revelation when you're not going to be here? You see, that's false teaching. And that gets many people in trouble because that's Satan's message. And so it is. You're supposed to be the one that remains in the field, the world, working and watching through the coming of the Antichrist to be a testimony against him and to, and to be present when Christ brings in the kingdom. How are you fixed, friend? Are you fixed with the word of God? Or are you going to be caught in the snare also? Not a good place to be. Verse 36. Watch ye therefore. That's what you are. As a Christian, you're supposed to be a watchman. Not only watching for yourself, but your brethren. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, uncondemned. Many are going to stand before him, but they're going to be condemned because they will have deceived themselves into worshiping the Antichrist. You know, many people teach the way you escape. It's a rapture. You're going to fly away. You don't have to worry about it. That is so wrong. The way you escape the hour of temptation is simply to be armed with the truth in your forehead where you're not tempted. You want me to say it again? The way you escape temptation is to be well enough aware of truth that you're not tempted by lies. You're not, if you are truly a servant of the living God, you hate lies. You despise false teaching. And you, there is no way you're going to be tempted by Satan when he comes claiming to be Messiah because you know who he is and you know what he's doing to your people. You know what he's doing to our Savior, and you will stand against him. Therefore, as it is, and according as it is written, you will stand against him and be count, accounted worthy, a servant of God, my good and faithful servant, well done, is what he will say. Uncondemned to stand before him. That's what a watchman does, and a watchman stays firm. It is amazing to me that some people, some teachers, along with this escape artist stuff, will absolutely take Matthew 24 or Mark 13 and preach a whole sermon about, I want to be the first one taken from that field. Talk about misleading a congregation. When a child, if they'll sit down and follow the subject and the object and pure, purely the, the um, ordinances, and the law of the English language, as well as any other language you're studying in. That means to follow what is being said by Almighty God. You know that the first one is taken by the Antichrist. Why would some preacher teach his whole congregation to be the first one to go when they're taken by the Antichrist? It shows you the level of intelligence in theology that we are swimming in, in this end time, when it is time for people to wake up to the simplicity in which Christ teaches. Stick with God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and leave the traditions of men out of it. Listen to your heavenly Father, follow him. Verse 37 to continue. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, as he had finished here. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. He, he would go to a little town called Bethany. It's on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. He spent much of his time there in that last six days that he would walk the earth here in the flesh body. And w what would he see there? on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, what would he see from Bethany there? He would be right above the valley of Kedron, 
which is the Valley of the Dead. There was a cemetery there. And right on across that, right up to the east gate of the temple itself, of which he would make the great entrance someday at that second advent, as it is written in the 14th chapter of Zacharias in the Old Testament, Minor Prophets, he would split away open right to that gate from this Mount of Olives here where he is spending this particular time meditating, teaching, talking in private to his disciples who are about to become apostles, meaning sent ones. Verse 38, And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. He did not hide. This message was not hidden away then, nor should it be now. It was not swept under the carpet then, and it should not be swept under the carpet today. Now, you know, many people will say, well, brother, if I were to teach that our people had to stand against the false Christ, I'd lose half my congregation or maybe more. Well, good, get rid of them. If they're that weak, you don't want them. But you know something? If you would have taught them properly, you wouldn't lose one. You would have gained so many, your church wouldn't even hold them from teaching truth. And, and that's as it is. The truth grows and spreads. You know, the first day after the resurrection that Peter and the others went forth, the church gained 3,000 souls. The next account after that a day or so, 5,000 souls. That's what truth will do for you. And Peter didn't hedge from teaching the truth. He let the Kenites know exactly what they had done. They had crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And that wasn't a pop popular message for that time at all. But never hide the truth. When God gives you a truth, share it. Okay? So with that said, what a beautiful chapter, that 21st chapter of Luke, the light giver. And... It is a precious teaching. It tells you how to survive the end times and the chronological order of events whereby you're not taken by surprise. Okay, chapter 22, verse 1. Let's go with a new thought here. Now the feast of the unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. This will be the last Passover. Christ will be with us on this earth. As a matter of fact, he will be the Passover lamb the lamb slain at this particular Passover. And um, this will be the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the, the Last Supper, okay, is what it's called, not the Passover feast itself. Verse 2, And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. Oh, nice bunch, huh? For they feared the people. In other words, the, so many people, I mean, he was going right in. He had taken a cat of nine tails and emptied out their corruption in the temple. And now God's truth was flowing through that temple. And he was messing up their secret societies. Quite frankly, they wanted to murder him. That lets you know who they were working for and who they were the children of. Verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. That's the man of Caroth, the city builder, a city boy. Verse 4, And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And it would take one of his own to where they could take him secretly, whereby there were not a bunch of people around. Now, these captains and these guards are not the Roman guards. They're your little temple tin soldiers that wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't put up a fight anywhere with, with uh, anyone. But Judas goes, and they're going to pay him. They're going to pay him 30 pieces of silver, which is prophetic and was prophesied long ago that that's what they would sell Christ for. And that 30 pieces of silver would later be brought to the temple by this city, this uh, man of Karoth, who, Judas. And he would throw it down on that temple floor and it would ring 
but it would be blood money and they could not keep it so they would buy the potter's field just outside the potter's gate for that 30 pieces of silver to bury the poor and the lost and those that couldn't afford a funeral. Broken pottery also to symbolize broken lives where the price of Christ's blood can put those pots back together, put that pottery back together, put lives back together that would believe upon him. That's what his price brought forth. But Judas trying to betray him. Verse 5, and they were glad and covenanted. They made a contract or an agreement to give him money, 30 pieces of silver. The prophecy came to pass. Six, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. That's without all the people being present to put a stop to it. We'll betray him. He was crude and he was slick and so were the, the Kenites that claimed to be of our brother Judah that had wormed themselves in through liturgical duties. All the way back to Ezra and Nehemiah's time where they would be called Nethanims, which means given to service of liturgical duties because the priests were lazy. That's why. Verse 7. And, um, and he then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed, okay, must be made ready. Verse 8, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Go, go on in, make, set it up, make it ready. Now, this is, this, is, um, this is the feast just before Passover. It's not the Passover feast itself. It's what many of you have these pictures of the so-called Last Supper. And um, that is what this is. It is Kagaga is what it is called, the, the feast before. So, and they go to prepare this way. What I will want you to see about this in the next lecture, he told them to go, but it had already been prepared. It was already set up. I want you to take comfort for that because everything God tells you to do, it will have already been prepared. It will have already been set up. That's why it always works so smooth. And that's why it is always so successful when God requests it. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Our father is the judge. He does not need our help in that. But you do have the right to spiritually discern who you should study with, and hopefully it would always be with someone that teaches God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's Word. For God's Word is eternal. Ages pass and go. Generations pass and go. God's Word never changes. It's a never a waste of time to analyze, meditate, 
and study the Word of God. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why, God knows what you're thinking. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. He, you are unique. And he looks to you, if you're one of his elect, for a testimony in these end times. Think about it. All right? Let him know that you love him because he indeed loves you. That's why he created you is for his pleasure. Let him know you love him. Won't you do that today? Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, Rodney from Georgia. Um, thank you, and our staff appreciates that. In your knowledge and discernment, do you believe loved ones who are with the Father can follow our lives in this earth age today? Uh, Rodney from Alabama. Well, we know from experience that in the um, transition of going from life to death in the flesh, which is going to life eternal, that we have, been, we have had loved ones return to show one through that maze which takes you right into the eternity, back to the Father. We, we know that, but also remember that they are in heaven they are in paradise, and uh, they have far better things to do, necessarily. But though the love is still there, and I feel they have no problem keeping up with what's happening here on earth, and, and probably even says a little prayer for some that need it real bad. Uh, Nina from Kentucky. And Nina says, I, I want to... I want I don't have a large income. Is it okay to take home my bills of grocery money to pay? Is it okay to take from my bills and grocery money to pay tithes? Uh, and I want to help all I can. Well, tithe is uh, is what is is um, your grocery money and your bills. They need to be paid. God expects his children to pay their bills. Now, what, when you're on a fixed income, what you have left over, if you want to give a love offering, that's fine. But don't, don't ever spend your grocery money to pay a tithe to some church, okay? Um, that is, that is, God does not expect that. There's a difference between a tithe. A tithe is 10%. Okay? And most people today on a fixed income when by the time they pay their medicine, their groceries, and I know this upsets a lot of ministries for me to say this, but God does not expect the senior citizens to be ripped off and, and go uh, even ruin and damage their reputation by not paying their bills to give the money to the church. You know, this is, this is where the teaching Corbin comes from. I even have a work titled Corbin, but it's it's mentioned in one of the Gospels even. That's where the preachers tell you, you can let your mom and daddy starve if you're giving it to the church. That's legal and that's all right. Well, it isn't all right in God's eyes. It's only all right in that particular church's eyes, which is not a church that worships Father. Okay, So, again, a love offering is a wonderful thing if you have something left over, but pay your bills and buy your groceries, okay? God expects that. And um, for a question for my daughter, please, uh, Katrina, please explain chapter Matthew 24 where it says, uh, woe to those that are with child and nursing babies. That means those that are spiritually impregnated. It doesn't mean a mother carrying an actual baby in her womb. It means you're supposed to be a virgin bride waiting for Christ. And do not be spiritually impregnated by the false teachings of Satan because Christ is returning for a virgin bride, spiritually speaking now. And those that nurse it means they're actually not only impregnated or, or transferred into Satan's church, but they're nursing it along. They're helping it. That's bad. 
Okay, we got Glenna Lee from California. Pastor Murray, will you please tell me in the Bible where I can find the verse, man cannot live by bread alone? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. That's one of the verses Satan tra uh, t t tempted Christ with. In the verse, those who live by the sword shall uh, die by the sword. Please explain. That's Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. Uh, would you explain both verses? Well, it, it means exactly that. What, what do you live by? Not by bread alone, but by the word of God. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 will help you with understand that better. The word of God is far more potent and sticks with you better than bread. Uh, bread won't get you through hard times. It may stuff your tummy. But it's not what lets you see and un with understanding the times and the events whereby you save your soul. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Those who choose to fight against the sword of the Lord, which is his turn, tongue, which is his word, they're going to hell. Okay, It's just that way. And many times taken captive can mean not negative, but in a good sense, in that same a verse in uh, Revelation 13, taken captive by who? If it's captive by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, uh, Laura from uh, South Carolina. Um, I watch nearly every moment. Okay, I, in heaven, while all souls wait for judgment, are the people who were saved and lived a holy life in the same place as those who lived a sinful life? No. They're all in paradise, but you've heard many times through this book of Luke from that 16th chapter, there's a gulf in between that they can't cross. And those on this other side are weeping, crying, begging, because they didn't make it, and they know it. Well, what determined that they didn't make it? The book of life. It's not judgment day. God didn't judge them to go there. He opens that book. Hey, it's all written down right there in heaven. That's where your church letter is at. It's not in some building out here somewhere. Your church letter is in heaven, and that's what God judges you by when you get there to determine which side of that gulf you go to in paradise. So um, some of them are happy and some of them are not, and it, it, needs, it needs not be said. Read uh, Luke 16 again. Mary from California. Let me find your question. Let's see here. How will I recognize him? This is a, a child, okay? When I get to heaven, I know spirits don't have eyes. What makes you think spirits don't have eyes? What does God's word say? Um, a spirit is only a part of the soul. A spirit's only the intellect of the soul. It's not supposed to have eyes. But his soul is there, and it does have eyes. What did God say in the beginning? Let us make man in our image. It means they look the same. So he will look the same to you when you see him there as he does now. As, as Ezekiel 44 in the millennium documents that you will recognize your loved ones and be able to help them if they didn't even make it um, during the millennium to get their course straight. Uh, so naturally you have to recognize them to be able to help them. Tammy from Michigan, can you explain the millennium? I know when we die, we're, we, we're, we're with the Father. I'm confused about hell. Who will be taught during that this time? And are people that uh, didn't make it going to be retested? Well, let's, let's say, when, when does hell come into being? Hell does not come into being until the lake of fire is created at the end of the millennium. Most translations, take your strong concordance and check this out for yourself. Every time hell is, hell is mentioned in the word, it's either properly translated as grave, supplica, and um, I won't mention uh, one other place, a holding place of uh, wicked ones, but be, it's, it's simply the grave, or Gehenna in the Greek outside of Jerusalem, the garbage pit. 
as an example of what hell will be like. But hell doesn't even exist. That's why they're in paradise and holding, and during the millennium, Christ elect will reign for a thousand years. Do you know why? Because a lot of people are going to say, well, you mean they've got a second chance? Listen to me. With what's being taught in this world today, there's a lot of people who haven't got a prayer of a chance. They're being misled, mistaught, and God will not condemn them to hell if they have been mistaught. They will have an opportunity to learn the truth, and the truth will set them free, or if they refuse it, they will go into the lake of fire, which will very definitely exist after the millennium. Do you know what it's called? Go to Revelation chapter 20 and you will find that those that do not take part in the first resurrection will possibly take part in the second resurrection or in the last verses of chapter 20 will take part in the second death, which is the death of the soul, the lake of fire. Uh, Leo from Maine, you've been, you've been a huge blessing to my life. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my question is, in the time of the millennium, why would any spirit not choose to follow God knowing the alternative is the lake of fire? That is a hard thing to understand, but as it is written, there are many that will. Hopefully, we will have been successful in saving most. Let's hope that and pray that, but we know from Revelation chapter 20 there will still be some. And that, that's good. We don't want them around us anymore. We want peace in this world, and that's the only way we will get it. Matilda from, um, Matilda from Connecticut. My question pertains to Mark 11, 12, Jesus curses the fig tree. I would like to know if you could please explain the parable. I do not understand why Jesus cursed the tree. Well, because the bad tree is bad. Again, you heard me teach earlier in the lecture today concerning uh, Jeremiah chapter 24, where there's two, two types of fig trees here. One is so bad, you can't, even, you can't eat the fruit. And this is literal, okay? But then the good figs, oh, they're juicy, sweet, and so very delicious. And uh, that's, that's the parable of the fig tree, as, as I forestated. Okay, uh, Sandra from North Carolina. I have a couple of questions. During the end, what will happen to women who are pregnant? It also says, woe to them that are giving suck. What is going to happen to them? Uh, and um, is the end going to be in the winter time? Well, it says pray that your plight is not in the winter. Why? We'll take that one first. What is um, harvest? Harvest is when crops are, are uh, harvested or brought into the barn. Harvest is done when? In the summer. You better pray that your plight is not in the winter because you don't, if you're being harvested in the winter, you're being harvested out of season. That means you're being plucked up by the roots by Satan and that's not a pretty sight okay but I think you've heard me explain earlier concerning a woman with child that that is that Christ when he explains or creates an analogy he puts it down where the rubber meets the road so that you can understand how he feels in other words he is our husband and he's been away for 2,000 years he comes home and his wife, supposed virgin bride, has a small baby and is nursing it. How, what does that mean? That means she wasn't fit to be a virgin bride. She fell off to Satan. And it hurts him. And that's what he's saying and that's exactly what he means. That's why he uses the spiritual connotation of um, impregnation in a spiritual sense so that you can know how he feels uh, about the situation. Okay, my, uh, my family and I owe, uh, are thankful for your teaching. My daughter, Mackenzie, 13, was wondering how God hears and deals with so many people 
at the same time. Well, because, because he created each of us in that he is able. That's why he called himself, I am that I am. I, I will be wherever I want to be. I'll be however I want to be. I can be all things to all people. And so he is. My other daughter, Kaylee, at 12, was wondering if there is any angel watching over us all the time like a guardian. And once again, we thank you so much for making God's Word easy to understand. Well, you're so welcome. Um, and tell her to, to read uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. God's elect, their angel, we're talking to the elect, not unbelievers now. God's elect, saints, set aside ones, as it is written in Matthew 18.10, they do have an angel that has the attention of God. The angel doesn't intercede, but he has God's attention whereby God can intercede in our lives when we need help. Okay, uh, Randy from Maryland. Um, when Father God decides to cast out Satan from heaven and God uh, demotes him, Will he have to be born of woman? Absolutely not. It's Satan. It is Satan that he's full blown, full grown, and doesn't and uh, not born of woman. Okay, he's he's cast out of heaven and he comes here in his supernatural body. You got to understand that, Randy, or you could be deceived. Okay, he's something. I mean, he is sharp. He's going to perform miracles, as it is written in Revelation 13, verses uh, 12, 13, and 14, in the sight of people that's going to be awesome, like snapping his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. Uh, you know, that puts on quite a show, and it will impress a lot of people that are very easily impressed. Uh, Susan from Ohio. I am puzzled over the graves opening in Matthew 27, 51, right after Jesus. My husband and I are puzzled, okay, of, of, of on the cross. The saints were raised and went into the city, appearing to many. Why did this happen? Well, it's real simple. It was to prove that Christ had defeated death. It's fulfilling the prophecy, that, that that is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 and 4. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Death, where is your sting? Why? He defeated death. Those people in Jerusalem knew all those that had died, and here they're walking around. They can see them. They're resurrected. They're raised to life. And it's a one-time thing to document that Christ, on the cross, that they had just crucified, had defeated death. And here all these, they, it only appeared they came out of the grave. They came from the Father again. It appeared they were. That point, that's the only thing people could relate to, was to see it, and it made believers out of many of them. And so it is. That's God's way of teaching. Uh, Randy from Canada. Thank you for your teaching, and God bless you and your staff at the chapel. Just had a question regarding some numbers. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There are 7,000 elect, Romans 11, 4, and 1 Kings 19, 10, and 7,000 fallen angels, Revelation 11, 13. If this is correct, and it is, who are the 144,000 people of Israel spoken of in 7, 4, are these other people that will start to wake up from hearing the Holy Spirit speak through the seven? You got it exactly right. But don't overlook something else in that seventh chapter of Revelation. When you read on concerning, this, this, is, this 144,000 is one of the reasons that some people who say, I just can't, I've talked to people and they just won't listen. Well, you've been telling the false Christ is coming that you're going to be delivered up. When you are, Deliver it up. And the Holy Spirit speaks through you. They're going to say, wow. They knew the truth. And they're converted. But what you don't want to overlook is in that same chapter, when you finish the 144,000, there are thousands on top of thousands that have already washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. You can't even count them that are saved and love the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't number them. 
And so don't ever let someone tell you there's only 144,000 going to be saved. That's a bunch of malarkey. Not to offend anyone, but they just need to read the rest of the chapter and learn. Christine from Kentucky. I can't seem to find in the Bible about Moses and Elijah. Where in the Bible may I find the word on them? Well, well, in, in more places than one, let's, well, let's take the book we're in now, Luke. We just covered it. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Remember, Christ went up, and here's Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Brian from Washington. I am a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and thanks to our father that I made it. I lived a rough life, often wondering why. Now I know my family and I have been with you for about 10 years now, and we were, we were led by the Holy Spirit to you. I believe we, we are to be, um, we are to be, you are there to, to make the final stand. We're, to, there, we're going to be there to make the final stand of the elect in the end times. Well, praise God. I'm glad that, and when a family is with you, that is great. You have, you're blessed to have a family with you. We're glad to have you with us. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Why? His letter sent to you chapter by chapter and verse by verse makes his day. When you read that letter with understanding and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. He's happy about you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you and only if we've helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. This has been a long time I've been promising a children's book. This is a book that will help uh, a parent teach their child exactly what God's Word states. Now, uh, this, this was done by a very good friend and student of this chapel. We have given it, if you would, a binder whereby if there is a page that you feel is too far advanced for your children, then by all means you should remove that particular uh, page. It is done in a material that is even washable and it takes you step by step into instructing a child what does God's Word say. And I, I think you will find it extremely helpful. It is item number 4414.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Rapture theory. Is it just a theory? We know from God's Word we're going to gather back to Christ. We, in our first lecture on this subject, 